I've been blogging about music for well over five years now, and I've never done a video blog post. So here's one. If you don't want to watch the video, you can just read the text below, which is what I'm doing. I'm just reading off the screen. But I did want to say this in my own voice. This post comes in the context of a lot of media coverage about vocal fry, and I did write a blog post about four years ago just grousing about vocal fry, but it got deleted when I purged the blog just to make sure that all the content was focused on conducting. Um, but as a conductor, I do make an important choice about how to use my voice, both speaking and singing, in rehearsal. And I consider the influence that my speaking and singing voices have on my singers as a vocal model for vocal production. Um, apparently, the media judge women who use vocal fry more harshly than men whose voices fry, and that had never occurred to me because I have always judged men and women who use vocal fry equally harshly. Not because I'm an old-fashioned fuddy-duddy who can't adapt to changing times and new trends and cultural whatever, no. I judge them because they are doing it wrong. And I'm not ju talking about casual speakers or judging just regular everyday people, everyday people who use vocal fry in their everyday speech. I'm talking about trained radio announcers, professional speakers, news broadcasters, people who ought to know better. Um, and I'll let sociologists argue about the overall merits of vocal pitch and whatever, and I have opinions about that, but for right now, for this purposes, let me just say that vocal fry is bad for you. It damages small, delicate muscles that need protection and to be used carefully. Your voice is made of cartilage and muscles. Um, the thyroid cartilage is in the middle of your neck, it's shaped like the barrel of a drum, sort of, and the thyroarytenoid cartilages, uh, muscles, thyroid muscles, stretch across the top of the thyroid cartilage. And when the thyroid cartilage tilts forward, um, it stretches the muscles, making them longer, like a rubber band. When the muscles are stretched longer, they create a higher pitch when they're vibrated. And when the cartilage tilts back, the muscles shorten, allowing them to vibrate at a lower frequency, producing a lower pitch. Now, a rubber band gets thinner when it stretches, and it gets fatter when it relaxes. But muscles have the capacity to resist this natural tendency, and how we shape those muscles determines the resulting vocal register. For example, when the muscle gets thinner and longer, that's what we call head voice, which is the most common way classically trained women sing. Um, men's vocal apparatus tends to be proportioned so it's less likely for them to have as much head voice. Um, their muscles come together and only the tendon, after a certain point, only the tendons touch, and it produces a re vocal register called falsetto, um, which is more breathy than head voice. And women don't have it because of the proportion of, of cartilage to muscle. The pitch we speak at is low compared to the range of classical vocal repertoire, um, and the muscles are relatively thick. This is our chest voice. It's the muscles uh, position where we usually speak. We keep the muscles fat as we stretch when we belt or yell, and there's only so far a muscle can go, and eventually it just cracks, catastrophically fails, and we get that yodely sound that we all would recognize. Um, or we can start with them long and thin in the head voice, and we can keep them thin as they shorten, which is what classically trained sopranos and altos do, maximizing resonance and minimizing muscular exertion, not letting the muscles get all big, but keeping them minimal, minimally exerted and using resonance in place of muscular exertion. At a certain point, the muscle can't get any shorter and still phonate a clean fundamental pitch. The muscles go all flappy and the fundamental goes away and the overtones get chaotic, and that is vocal fry. The muscles are short and thick, vibrating against each other violently, uh, and it's just another vocal register like any other. Long and thin, medium and fat, somewhere in between, and vocal fry is just the lowest you get. You can't get any lower. The muscles are as thin and short and fat as it can get, and it just can't produce a clean fundamental pitch anymore. A singer may choose to use any register at any pitch for some expressive reason, but vocal fry is a register where the muscles lend themselves to the development of damage, like vocal nodules. So if you consider um, a singer like Louis Armstrong, who sings in that cool, jazzy growl, um, that was really interesting uh, artistically, but he had surgery on his vocal apparatus several times in his life, and he can make whatever choice he wants uh, for the expressive purposes of his art, but I don't think I'd choose a technique that required surgery to maintain. And I think the same goes for Kesha. She, Kesha can choose to use vocal fry for expressive purposes, but she can't expect to do it a lot and not have any physiological consequences. Um, so that's what vocal fry is. It's just a vocal register like any other. 
um, but it's not one that we're intended to use all the time. The, the vocal apparatus is not constructed in a way to support the use of those muscles in that way. So this brings me to one of the reasons I think people react so strongly and negatively to vocal fry, and that is that if an otolaryngologist, they've actually done this, an otolaryngologist puts a camera down your throat and takes a picture of your vocal muscles, um, even when you are silent, if you are listening to a human voice, your muscles try to reproduce what you are hearing. Uh, so you're sitting quietly, not making any noise, and your vocal apparatus attempts to do the same thing that would be required of it if you tried to reproduce the sound that you're hearing. So your vocal muscles act like you're making sound even when you're not. And I think that when we listen to someone using vocal fry, that our muscles try to reproduce the vocal fry just like they try to reproduce any human voice we hear, but because that is not a physiological condition or set of circumstances that this apparatus is intended to stay in for a long period of time, it's physically uncomfortable. Now for me, as a, classically, as a choral conductor and a classically trained singer, I'm listening and analyzing voices all the time and it's very much a conscious process for me. So it's painful. I can't listen to extended use of vocal fry. It hurts me and it makes me very uncomfortable. But I think for most people, when they perceive vocal fry, their, ap their vocal apparatus goes into this fry position empathically, sympathetically, and it's uncomfortable below the level of conscious awareness. So they may not be aware of why it makes them uncomfortable, but they lash out with the, with the, based on the discomfort. So if you choose to use vocal fry in your singing or your speaking for expressive reasons or to communicate something about your identity, awesome, have at it. But do it with the full knowledge that you might be doing physical damage to yourself. And don't be surprised if people respond strongly and negatively, not because they're sexist or against youth culture or just judgmental, it's because you have empathically put them in literally an uncomfortable position. You've literally put their vocal apparatus in an uncomfortable position. It's a physiological extreme our bodies are not intended to maintain. So I teach my students about, about it the way a health teacher may explain you shouldn't eat ice cream all day every day. It's perfectly fine in moderation, but it's not good for you if you have too much. A little bit of ice cream, awesome. A little bit of vocal fry, no problem. All day, every day, there's going to be some consequences. So for that reason, I think professional speakers have a responsibility to avoid it. That includes you, NPR announcers. That includes you, news broadcasters. I definitely think that conductors also have to use their voices healthfully um, as models for their ensembles, but a lot of conductors have training as singers, and so they already know this stuff. And one last thing. I suspect that women tend to use vocal fry because they're trying to make their, pitch, their voices lower pitched. Because they've learned from patriarchy that a lower pitched voice is associated with authority. And higher pitched voices and head voice register in general have implicitly come to be associated with ditziness and stupidity and weakness. So vocal fry is a response to that, a result of women wanting to sound strong and like leaders. But I think that's a mistake. Instead of telling the media to stop criticizing vocal fry so that we can continue to do damage to our vocal apparatus, I think that women should persist in using their warm, resonant, healthy speaking voices from a position of leadership and authority so that people can learn that femininity sounds like leadership as much as masculinity. <laughs>